Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achano and welcome back to my C++ series. I'm back home in Melbourne now, so no more crazy hotel rooms or anything. I'm in the studio, if you could call this a studio. And today we're gonna to be talking about arrays in C++. So before we start talking about arrays, it's really important that you understand what pointers are. I made an entire video based on pointers. There will be a card on the screen or a link in the description below. Definitely check that out first before this video. Pointers are pretty much the basis for how arrays work in C++, so you definitely need to understand that. So first of all, what is an array? An array is basically a collection of elements. It's a bunch of things in a particular order. In our case, in C++, an array is basically a way to represent a collection of variables. It's basically a bunch of variables, usually of the same type, in a row. The reason this is so important and so useful is because there are countless times where we want to be able to represent a whole collection of data, a whole bunch of data. And it just doesn't make sense for us to create a whole bunch of variables that really should be grouped together in one data set. Because variables need to be created manually, we need to actually go into the code and specify variables and give them names. Whereas sometimes we just want to be able to store, say, 50 integers that represent some sort of data. We don't want to have to specify like integer number one, integer number two, and so on all the way to 50 because that, first of all, is just like, that's just terrible because that that's just, that's completely unfeasible and unmaintainable. Imagine having to set all of those variables to zero. You literally have to write 50 lines of code that just set all of your variables to zero manually. It's, really, really hard to deal with a lot of variables. So what we wanna do in that case is just use an array to contain all of those 50 elements of the same type, in this case, integers, to make our lives much, much easier. So just remember, an array is basically like having multiple variables in one variable. We give an array a single name, and through that, we can refer to as many variables as we created the array with. Let's dive into some code and take a look. So defining an array is quite simple. Suppose that I wanted an array of five integers. I would simply write the type that I want the array of, I would then give it a name, for example, example. And then in square brackets, I put how many I want. So we'll just say five. And that's it. I now have an array of five integers. I've basically allocated enough space to store five integers. Now, in order to actually set and access those integers, I can write the name of the array, and then inside square brackets, something called an index. And an index is which variable inside that array I'm actually referring to, which element I'm referring to. So to set the first one, we're gonna write zero because arrays in C++ start with zero. In some languages, such as Lua, they start with one, which is very, very weird and kind of uncommon. Usually arrays start with zero, meaning that zero is the first element. And we can set this like, like it was any other integer because it is just an integer now. Whilst this is an array of integers, when we access one of those elements at a specific index, we get the underlying type of the array, which is just an integer. We can set this equal to two, for example. Now you can probably notice here that we allocated space for five integers. However, the first index is zero, which would mean that since we allocated space for five integers, the last index is actually four, not five, because index number five would actually be the sixth element. Let's set this to something like four. I'm gonna leave the other ones unset. Now, reading these is equally as simple. If we wanted to print one, we would just specify which index we wanted to print like this. If we just specify the actual array, then it's just going to print the memory address of it because this is actually a pointer type. And as I mentioned, when you index an element inside the array, you get back the underlying data type. So in this case, an integer. So I can of course create a new variable and then copy the value from the array back into that variable. And you can see that the data type here is just a normal integer. If I try and access an index that is not inside the array, for example, I try and access example at negative one or example at five, that will cause something called a memory access violation because I'm trying to access memory that doesn't belong to me. Now in debug mode, you will actually get an error message and a crash displaying to help you debug those problems. However, in release mode, you probably won't which means that you've just written into memory that isn't yours. Now, it's really important that you actually be careful with this and make sure that you're always writing inside the bounds of the array, because if you're not, it can cause problems that can be fairly difficult to debug because you've just modified memory that wasn't part of this array, however, might be part of another variable in your source code. So you've just literally gone ahead and changed some other variable in your code to something else without realizing it. So just make sure that you set up safety checks where needed to make sure that you're not writing outside of the bounds. We'll talk more about this specific problem and stuff like that in the future. Now, arrays go really well with for loops because for loops are indexable loops that go through a particular range, right? So if we wanted to set every single value inside our example array, a for loop is a really good way of achieving this. Without a for loop, we would have to go through all of these indices and actually set them manually. 
And that's how we would achieve setting everything to two. However, by creating a for loop that goes through the entire length of our array, which is five, and simply sets example at i equal to two, what we've done is we've looped through the entire array, meaning we've gone through index zero to index four. Since index four is the last point at which i is less than five, we could have also written less than or equal to four. However, no one really writes code like this. And also it'll be a bit of a performance hit because you're doing a less than and equals comparison. So it has to do that equals comparison instead of just a less than comparison. So it's almost always written as less than five instead of less than or equal to four. If we run this code now, I'll just put a breakpoint on our cn.get, we can take a look at what this actually looks like in our memory. So I'm gonna go up to this memory view here. If you wanna know more about that, I made a video on debugging in C++, again, link in the description and a card on the screen to that. But over here, I'm just gonna to go to the memory address of my array. So example is actually a memory address of its own because example is an integer pointer. So I'm gonna just type in example over here. And you can see that what I've got here is my twos in a row. So one other really important thing about arrays is that they store their data contiguously, which means they store their data in a row. So I've allocated space for five integers, meaning I'm literally going to get one integer after the other in memory. Each integer is four bytes. So what I've got here is 20 bytes worth of memory in a row, which is divided into kind of four byte segments, it's not really divided into four byte segments. However, when we access it through our code and all that, it is for all intents and purposes divided into four byte segments, even though there's, there's no literal division. So that's what you see over here in this memory view. You see five twos, which take up four bytes each because they are integers. Now, when we access a specific index, by writing example i, what it actually does is it takes an offset to this memory. So if I write example at index two, it's going to start at the beginning of the array, which you can see is this memory address here, and it's going to simply add on eight bytes. Because each integer is four bytes, we want to access element number two, which is the third element, since indexing starts at zero. So element number two will be two times the size of each element, so two times four in our case, which bumps us eight bytes forward to this integer over here. So if we write a value to example at index two, it will write to that portion of memory. Now, as I mentioned, an array is really just a pointer. It's an integer pointer in this case to that block of memory, which contains our five integers, which means that I can actually create a variable here, which is just, just an integer pointer and give it the value of example. And you can see that works fine and that will compile just fine because example is just an integer pointer. Now, as I pointed out, accessing element number two and setting it equal to five or something like that will result in us basically writing to an offset of eight bytes from pointer. So this code over here can actually be rewritten using simple pointer arithmetic to actually be pointer plus two because we're accessing two elements forward, then dereferencing this and then setting it equal to something like six, for example. Let's move our for loop up before this and give this a shot and see what we get. I'll put a breakpoint right over here. So if I go to example, which is the memory address of our array, you can see that element number two, the third element is set to five. And then of course, when I hit F10, it should be set to six instead. So let's hit F10. And you can see over here that it was changed to six. Now, I did say eight bytes. However, you can see that I wrote plus two for this pointer. The reason I did that is because when you're dealing with pointer arithmetic, so basically when I'm just adding values like two to a pointer, the number of bytes that it's actually gonna add is gonna depend on the type. So in this case, since the pointer is an integer pointer, it's going to add two times four because four is the size of each integer. If I wanted to actually deal with bytes, I could cast this pointer to a data type that is just one byte large, for example, a char. And then if I do that, I'll have to add on the eight bytes that I talked about. Since I then want to write in an integer, which is four bytes, not just a single char, which is one byte. Once I actually do the plus eight, I would need to cast this back into an integer pointer. And then of course dereference it to get my integer so that I can set it equal to six. Now this is a pretty wild line of code, but let's check it out. When I hit F5, go to my example. You can see it's set to five. I'm gonna hit F10 and you can see we get the exact same result. This is set to six. So yes, you can get pretty fancy with this, but Essentially what I wrote here is exactly what this indexing does. It's not magic, that's how arrays work. They're just a contiguous block of data and you can, in, you can literally index them like they were a book and write to a specific page, or in this case, a specific integer. Now we're gonna wrap this up here pretty soon because I don't wanna get too in depth into arrays and confuse you. However, you can also create arrays on the heap. We haven't talked about the stack or the heap much or how memory really works much. I definitely am gonna to get to that very, very soon. However, for now, similarly to how we can create classes by using the new keyword, we can also create arrays by using the new keyword. So I'll make another array here. I'll call this one another. 
This will be an int pointer, and then I'll set it equal to a new int with the size that I want. So let's go with five again. This code is identical to this code. However, the lifetime is different. Since this is created on the stack, it will get destroyed when we reach the end curly bracket and we get out of this scope. However, this, since it's created on the heap, will actually be alive until we destroy it or until our program ends. So you need to actually delete it using the delete keyword. And since this is an array and we allocated it using the array operator here, so we use the new keyword with the square brackets, we need to delete it using the square brackets like this as well. Let's go ahead and bring back that for loop for our example. We'll set this equal to two, and I'll do the exact same thing for our other array except another equal to two. Of course, I could have written this in a single for loop, but let's hit F5. So if I type an example over here in my view, I get my five twos in a row. And of course, if I type in another, I'm also going to get the exact same result. So why would you allocate dynamically using the new keyword rather than just creating it on the stack? The biggest example is to do with lifetimes, right? Because like anything that you allocate with new, it will be around until you delete it. So if you have a function returning a new array, for example, you have to allocate it using the new keyword unless you pass in a memory address via the parameter or something like that. If you want to actually return an array and it's a brand new array that was created inside the function, you need to use the new keyword. Another thing to think about though is memory indirection. Basically what I mean by that is since we're actually holding a pointer, that pointer is going to point to another block of memory which holds our actual array, which results in kind of memory fragmentation and cache misses and all of this complex stuff that we're definitely gonna talk about in future videos. However, I'll show you a quick example so that you know what I mean. If I create a class over here called entity and I move my example array over here, I'll also create a constructor which basically just is my for loop that initializes all of this to two, and I'll make everything here public. If I create my entity object like this, I'll get rid of all this other code and hit F5. If I go to the memory address of my entity and hit enter, you can see that I've got all my memory right there. The memory address of entity actually just inline contains all of my twos all of my data. However, if I go back here and I switch this over here to be created on the heap by using the new keyword, I'll run that exact same code. You can see that if I go to the memory address of my entity, I don't see my twos there at all. I see this other memory address, which of course is this pointer. Now I can copy this and put it here. I'll have to reverse it because of the endianness though. So this will actually be 0075E and hit enter, I get taken to my actual data. So there's that indirection again. We've actually got the memory address of E, which contains another memory address to where our actual array is, which means that when we want to access this, we're basically jumping all around our code. First to get to the entity, then to get to the array, all of that stuff. So of course, whenever possible, you wanna create your array on the stack to avoid that because jumping around memory like that is definitely a performance hit. Now, there's one more thing I wanna mention. I know this is a huge video. I hope you guys like these kind of massive videos and you have time to watch them, but I wanna mention arrays in C++11. In C++11, we've got something called standard array, which is an actual inbuilt data structure. It's built into the C++11 library. A lot of people really like using it over the raw array that I've shown you here because it offers a number of advantages namely being that it includes bounce checking and it actually keeps track of the size of our array. One more thing that I didn't mention is that there's actually no way to work out the size of our array. If we allocate an array on the heap like this, we've specified it to be five and in many other languages, we can actually write something like example.size. You can't do that in C++. There's no way for you to actually know the size of an array. Now, I say no way, obviously there is some way because when you delete this array, the compiler needs to know how much memory to actually free. So yes, there is a way to know, but it's compiler dependent. It's possibly sometimes stored at a negative index inside the array, so like index negative one. It depends on a lot of things and it's very, very, you can't trust it basically. So you should never be accessing the size of an array in the array memory itself. That's dangerous. If you allocate an array on the stack, so if I write int a and then five, you can find out what the size actually is because of course it's allocated on the stack, which means there's the stack point contains the offset basically. So if you write size of a, what you'll actually get is the size of the array in bytes. So in this case, we have an integer, which is four bytes. We have five of them. So we have 20 bytes. This will give you 20 bytes. 
So if you want to know how many elements are in there, you can divide them by the size of the data type, which is int. So this code will actually give you the count in terms of elements. I like to refer to this as count, not size. Personally, when I deal with, with the word size, I'm talking about bytes. And when I deal with count, I'm talking about number of elements. So this will give you five, which is the number of elements that we've allocated. However, if you try the same thing with this example instead, then what you're actually gonna get here is the size of an integer pointer, which is four bytes. And then you're gonna divide it by five, which will give you four fifths, or since this is an integer, it will give you zero and not 0 0.8, which is wrong anyway. So you can only use this trick with stack allocated arrays. If you had changed this to be a stack allocated array, like so, it would also work. That would also be fine. However, you really can't trust this. And of course, as soon as you decide to pass this into a function or anything, it becomes an int pointer, and then you're just, you're screwed. So what you have to do instead is actually just maintain that size by yourself. I know it kind of sucks in that sense, but it's just, that's just how C++ works. You have to maintain it yourself. The way that I would write this code personally is I would declare a const int size to be five, and then I would put this in here. Now I love that this gives us an error because you can't actually do that. When you allocate an array on the stack, it has to be a compile time known constant. Has to with an asterisk because this is C++ and there are ways around this, which we'll talk about in a later video. However, this has to be known at compile time. So you have to basically mark it as static. You can also use a constant expression here. Constant expressions inside classes have to be static anyways, you can see. Another story for another video. This this video is gonna have so many spin-offs because we're really getting into the juicy stuff now. I hope you guys are excited about that. So we'll just make this static and we don't really need this to be a constant expression. So that's really how you deal with this. And in this case, I would probably call this something like example size because it's dealing with the example array specifically. And then you can put this into all of your for loops and all that stuff to actually know the size of your array. That's just what you gotta do. If you use a C++ 11 standard array, you don't have to, I'll quickly show you guys how to do that. You can just write std array. We'll make sure to include this as well. Let's just include array. We'll give it a name, for example, another and we basically have to give it a type and a count if we put an angular bracket here it says we need the type name and the size so we'll write int as the type comma five as the size and that's it we've created this array and to fill it up of course we can actually do another dot size and there we go we have five so it's an easier way to deal with this of course it does have the overhead because it does all of the bounds checking if you wanted to and also it actually maintains a size integer as well which you might not want so there is a bit of overhead usually it's worth it so consider using this we'll have a whole video on how this actually works and all that stuff in when, when we finally reach data structures and start talking about them but just something to think about personally i use raw arrays all the time most people probably do they're a little bit faster and i personally don't really run into many problems with them but again if you're being super safe and you were probably coming from another language you probably do want to use standard array if i'm being completely honest it's a lot safer to use standard array than raw arrays. However, I like to live dangerously. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can show me by hitting that like button. And if you really want to support this series and see more great episodes like this, then you can go to patreon.com forward slash the channel. You'll get access to a whole bunch of rewards for showing your support there. And it really does help me produce these videos. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.